Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 22, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budget Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our thoughts on what the effect on the fiscal policy debate will be of a two-person race for Alaska governor. Second, how the fiscal issues play in the young Galvin race for Alaska's U.S. House seat. And third, where does AGDC go after Walker under a new governor? And now, let's join Michael. Hey, it's actually Tuesday, which is our deep dive day down in the weeds. It's where we get a chance to talk about uh, big issues that concern us. Brad Keithley is the director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad is a former oil and gas consultant attorney. Uh, you know, he's got a background in economics and, and law and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and he comes in every week to kind of, you know, talk with us about all these different issues and the effect on Alaska as a whole, and we've got his weekly top three ahead, so let's jump into it. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing good. Let me make sure that you are fully turned up and ready to go. Um, so it uh, has become, it was a very interesting weekend, let's put it that way, in yeah. politics, was it not? It, it, it truly was. Uh, uh, it's been an interesting last few days, With first with uh, Lieutenant Governor Blatt's uh, uh, resignation, and then the governor trying to carry on, and then the governor not not carrying on, uh, suspending his campaign, and 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 you know I've been I've been following the anchor, the Alaska Press to try to sort of figure and get the insights about what's going on, and and I'm not sure anybody's really sure how this is going to shake out yet. We're sort of like we're beginning a new campaign with two weeks left, a two week sprint to the end. Right. Well, exactly. Nobody seems to really want to comment on. Uh, you know, the metrics of, of, of where the numbers are, anything else. I mean, the la the last poll was like three or four days before uh, Malat announced. Ivan Moore had the last poll out, which according to Moore's poll, if even if you did the two-way matchup, Dunleavy would still eke out a win. But again, there's a lot of what-ifs in there. Um, and of course, there's questions about what did Malat actually do. Craig Medred had a great piece on why there should be transparency and why the Alaska media should step up and be doing their job, which you and I have talked about in the past as well. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows what's going on, and yet here we sit. So your number one top three, your number first one of the top three is, you know, the, the governor's race. Now it's a two-party race. So... What does Brad Keithley think? Let's get your take on it. Forget about the, the press and all the other talking heads. You're the guy that's important to us here. So tell us what happens here, Brad. Well, I, 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 think, there's, I think there's two big messages. One uh, is we now have two PFD supporters in the race. Uh, Governor Walker, who uh, had vetoed the PFD and had endorsed SB 26, which is indefinite as to the PFD. We didn't know what kind of PFD we were going to get out of uh, SB 26. It seemed like it was going to be a year-to-year -year ad hoc deal. Uh, Walker's dropped out, uh, and that leaves Begich and, and Mike Dunleavy, uh, both of whom have committed to... Oh, my goodness. Uh, we just lost Brad's phone call, so let me, uh, let me reach back to Brad right now and see if we get him back uh, on the phone. I don't know what happened, but apparently, again, it's Monday. Murphy is in the house. Mur Murphy is in the house, ready to go. Oops, did I drop out? Yeah, no, something, something happened. You dropped right out. You were saying, um, and I don't even recall what you were saying. I panicked so hard. Uh, <laughs> you were you were just talking about the dropout, though, in the, uh, of the race. Okay, so, 
so I, 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 what I was what I was trying to say is there are two things sort of that, that I've taken away immediately from the dropout uh, and where it leaves us on fiscal policy. One is we now have the, the remaining two candidates, Begich and Dunleavy, are both PFD supporters. Now, they support different types of PFDs, and I'll get into that in a second. But the, but the big takeaway is we now have two PFD supporters, both of whom – have promised to constitutionalize their version uh, or attempt to constitutionalize their version of the PFD. The candidate who was at best ambivalent about the PFD, Governor Walker, who seemed to want to do it on a year-to-year -year basis and, and set the amount on a year-to-year -year basis, is gone. So uh, we now we now have two two fairly strong PFD candidates. That's a that's a plus. But each of those candidates sort of come. To the come to the campaign now as the smoke is clearing. Sort of come to the campaign with with fiscal policies that are have some have some issues with them. Dunleavy, as, as we've talked about previously on the show, has overpromised. Right. He's promised a full full PFD. Right. No taxes and a 4.3 operating 4.3 billion dollar operating budget. You can't you can't do that, and you certainly can't do that and start paying back the CBR. Uh, which, as we've talked about on previous shows, you have to do. Something's going to have to give uh, in, in among Dunleavy's promises. He can't deliver on all of them. So to some degree, I, I, I mean, he's a happy warrior. He's, he's smiling a lot. He's certainly preaching a positive message, certainly pro-supportive pro, uh, on resource development issues, which Begich is not. Right. Uh, and, and Mike certainly uh, going down the right road in terms of terms of those issues, but he's overpromised on fiscal issues, and we're not quite sure what we're getting on the day after the election uh, in terms of which of those uh, fiscal issues are going to have to give. Begich, on the other hand, has, has, is under-delivering on the PFD. The type of PFD that he's proposing, uh, which is 50 percent of the POMV, uh, percent of market value draw, set by SB 26, at least it's 50 percent. But it's 50 percent of the of the of the draw set by SB 26, and SB 26 relies on a draw rate 5 percent that's too low. I mean, historically, the the the, the permanent fund corporation has earned a six plus percent rate of return if you look at it over history, um, on average, uh, and 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 look at it several ways on average, it still comes out six plus. Mark's uh, uh, PFD is set on 50 percent of a 5 percent. Uh, rate of uh, return uh, or draw rate on uh, using a POMV. So he's set a draw rate that's too low, and that has two implications. One is it's a lower PFD than we should have. Uh, even if you're going to use a POMV, it's a lower PFD than we should have, and it gives less to government. Since the other 50% goes to government, it's drawing less for government from the permanent fund earnings stream than we could. Uh, based upon uh, on the permanent fund corporation's historic average, and that then has the knock-on consequence of increasing the gap between spending levels uh, and and revenue levels that will increase the pressure for income taxes. So Dunley or uh, Begich has problems on his PFD, different from Dunleavy's, but but certainly uh, as serious. And then Begich, Begich, in all honesty, is extremely vague. Beyond the PFD, he's extremely vague. With respect to his fiscal plan, Dunleavy, right. uh, even though the 4.3 is a bad number, Dunleavy at least has that number out there. Begich won't give you a number, and he won't tell you. He, he talks vaguely about cuts, but he doesn't say where the cuts are going to be, and he doesn't talk about what the gap filler is going to be. I mean, he, he talks about a, a, a spending number. He's got a low revenue number uh, because oil prices remain uh, – oil revenues aren't, aren't going to fill that. Uh, you're pulling less from the permanent fund corporation than you should, so you're leaving a gap in there. And he's not really telling us how he's going to fill that gap. So you don't, we don't have a Goldilocks situation. We don't have too much, not enough, just right. We've got too much, <laughs> not enough, uh, and vague about the not enough. And, and it's leaving voters, in my view, it's leaving voters sort of in a quandary. Do you, right. do you, pick, do you go down the Dunleavy track? Uh, and end up with not really knowing what you're going to get at the end because he's going to have to give something up or go down the baggage track and, and really not know what you're going to get because uh, 
because because he's not filling out his fiscal plan. Well, so this begs the question then, um, you know, or, or I guess goes back to the old euphemism: you don't take people by their words; you take them by their actions. Uh, and if we did that, we see that uh, you know Mark Baggage. Uh, in his history of uh, of public service, both as a mayor, uh, as a as a as a, a senator, um, has no problem being m- more in line of the tax and spend type politician. He has no problem building budgets up. He has no problem increasing taxes uh, and doing things like that. Uh, whereas Mike Dunleavy does have a history of talking about fiscal reform, of putting bills forward to cut the budget, whether or not they could get passed or not. He did champion those things. Do you think that that matters, those two things? Oh, I absolutely think those matters. And certainly, you know, you, you've got to, given Begich's history, you've got to you've got to close those information gaps on what his fiscal plan is, what his spending level is going to be, how he's going to fill that fiscal gap. You've got to close that with, with assuming that it's going to be higher spending and it's going to be taxes. Uh, as he did in Anchorage on property taxes, it's going to be taxes that are going to other taxes in addition to PFT cuts that are going to be that are going to close that fiscal gap. On Dunleavy's side, you've got you've got a history that would seem to tell you that the thing that's going to give uh, among the things he's promised is spending levels. That is, he proposed in the past in 2017, he proposed a spending plan that had significant cuts and got us down to a long-term sustainable level. And, and I was doing just when, – when Dunleavy announced, I thought, this is great. We've got somebody who's got a detailed fiscal plan. We're going down that road. We're going to be able to deliver the day after the election where we know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to build up a mandate for that during the election cycle. It's, it's this diversion that he did in August off on this 4.3 operating budget that really really sends that all, all into, into an area where you don't know what it's going to be. So – I, I think, you know, Begich, you, you tend to think that Begich is going to, as you say, given history, is going gonna, is gonna to overspend and is going to, you know, fill that gap with, with other taxes. You tend to think, given history, that Dunleavy is, is, is going to be inclined to, to, to make deeper spending cuts if we can get a legislature that supports him, uh, if we can get a Senate that has a conservative block, as we've talked about on previous shows, elects Ron Gillum in District O to replace Peter Vincecki, give us give us five strong conservative senators. Um, if we can do that, then you tend to think that Dunleavy is going to err on the side of, of sort of going back to the old Mike Dunleavy and making spending, spending cuts. So, yeah, I, I think history tells you a lot about this, but it's not clear. And, and, and Dunleavy, you know, as we've talked about on previous shows, Dunleavy has contributed to muddying the waters by by stepping out there with this 4.3 operating budget in the midst of the campaign uh, in a way that, that is, is inconsistent with his past and just, you know, has created uncertainty about exactly what he's up to. Right. And, and of course, the, the question is, too, what <clears throat> excuse me, what effect does um, Bill Walker's name remaining on the ballot also have? I mean, I, I think you'll probably see, um, you know, you'll probably see at least 10 percent. Uh, still vote for Walker, even though that he's announced that he's out of the race. I mean, we saw that. <clears throat> Somebody made a comment that we saw that in 1972 when Nick Baggage's plane went down three weeks before the election, uh, and he was missing, presumed dead, and he still won the election here in the state yeah. of Alaska. I mean, uh, it's going to still pull because he's on the ballot, because all those absentee ballots are out there, because all these things are going on. He's still going to pull. So you want to give me here as we as we wrap up, you want to give me the spread that you think that uh, this may be at or give me some odds here on a baggage uh, um, Dunleavy two way race with Walker and floating around in the background on the ballot. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do better than that. I'll give you I'll give you some comments from my favorite one of my favorite statisticians, Ed King. And Ed has, has run some numbers and he said Begich has a chance if Walker finishes with less than 7% of the vote. Um, but if Walker finishes with, with greater than 7% of the vote, uh, that Begich really has no chance. There aren't enough votes left. And he's gone through and analyzed the, the vote totals that you, that, you could, that, you, that you would expect a winner would have to have. Um, and, he, and he said, you know, if, if Walker ends up taking greater than 7% of the total vote, Begich doesn't have enough votes left uh, to be able to put together a winning, uh, a winning hand. So if Walker ends up with that magic 10% that everybody's talking about, it's going to be tight. 
Uh, right. But, but according to Ed, Ed King's numbers, it's not enough. Yep. Well, and of course, this becomes uh, behooves uh, Mark Beggage now to educate everybody that Bill Walker is out of the race. So we'll see what happens with that. Brad Keithley's our guest. The Michael Duke Show continues right here on your home for common sense, liberty based, free thinking radio. Let's uh, continue now our deep dive with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He and I have been talking about uh, a lot of uh, different issues, but we're focusing right now on his weekly top three. We just finished up in our discussions on the two-way governor's race, uh, and now we're going to move on to our single congressional seat and what uh, what's going on there. You want to talk about the handshake, Brad? Do you want to talk about the handshake between <laughs> Elise Galvin and Don Young? Or you know, what do you, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I've, I've shaken Don Young's hand. It, it's a it's an experience, but I her reaction was a little over overblown. I don't know if she was going for a <laughs> you know a potential for a, a YouTube. Uh, viral moment or exactly what right it, it, it reminds me again of those somebody mashed up all those soccer moves where somebody touches a guy's ear and he falls over like somebody cut his ear <laughs> off with it i mean you know it just looked like one of those soccer moves where oh look what he hurt me kind of thing i was just like wow you know uh but let's talk about serious stuff with that race uh because there's questions on fiscal policy and some other things what are your thoughts on it well we, this is a race we haven't talked about at all on the show, and I thought it was, as we approach election day, I thought it would be useful to talk about it. There's a lot of stuff from a fiscal policy standpoint with Don Young to complain about. I mean, we've got a $21 trillion national debt. Uh, we've got, uh, we're now uh, approaching a $1 trillion annual deficit to add on top of that debt. Uh, the, the debt this year, the, the deficit this year was over 700 and about $775 million. Almost half of that, or a little over half of that, well, almost half of that came from two things. One, the tax cuts uh, that were that were done without spending cuts, uh, and second, uh, the, the spending bill that actually increased. Same time we were doing tax cuts, reducing revenue, we're increasing um, uh, spending. That added some, you know, three hundred and fifty million dollars to to this year's deficit to bring it up to seven hundred and seventy five million dollars. So there and, and Don Young voted for all of that, enthusiastically voted for all of that. He's one of those Republicans that, you know, promised to be a fiscal conservative and by gosh, during the Tea Party Revolution he was right there and he was gonna right. go to Washington and be part of help, helping to clean it up if the Republicans got back in control. And then the Republicans got back in control and promptly forgot about all that uh, and have made, have made the nation's fiscal situation uh, even worse. So right. there, you, could, you could do a campaign against Don Young but Ali, on fiscal issues, but Elise Galvin hasn't even come close. No. I mean, she hasn't, she hasn't even mentioned fiscal policy uh, as an issue. And, in fact, some of the things she talks about, um, uh, basically Medicare for all, uh, which is the, the Bernie Sanders approach to, to solving the, the nation's health uh, health issues, um, uh, would make would make the fiscal issues even worse. So Don Young definitely, I think, is is worthy of a challenger. And if somebody came in uh, on a fiscal platform, I would be a hundred percent behind that person and 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 would point out all of Don Don Young's flaws. But at least Galvin is not that person. And um, and and I think. Uh, to some degree, uh, we even even makes the problem makes the problem worse, and uh, and isn't the right um, replacement for Don Young certainly on the on fiscal issues. Right. Well, no, and I saw a commentary the other day, a headline that I thought I agreed with, and he said what Don Young needs is a Republican challenger, not a Democratic challenger. Which again, we could get into philosophical discussions uh, because there's been plenty of Republicans who basically said, "Give us the keys to the kingdom, and we'll fix it all for you," and then promptly forgot about it, as you just mentioned. Uh, but I think that you know what we really need to do is we need to start talking about. Uh, if there's if the Republicans are serious about this, they need to start talking about that transition of power, because here's a guy he's in his 80s. Uh, I mean, he's healthy as a horse, but who knows? I mean, he could you know look what happened with Ted Stevens. His plane went down. You know, baggage's plane went down. I mean, you know, we live in a rough we love live in a, uh, a rough country. Something could happen, or he could just drop dead tomorrow. You don't know. Uh, we need to we need to get this into a you know to this ease this into it and get some kind of replacement ready to go when this uh, when this is all said and done. 
he had a challenger uh, from the Valley this time who, who focused on uh, uh, fiscally con- fiscal issues and focused on the fiscally conservative aspects. And certainly, you know, I think I think Don Young's exposed to those. But but Young's name recognition is so high, right? Uh, that it's going to take it's going to take somebody uh, with name recognition. I mean, we both remember that Parnell uh, ran against him, attempted to primary him uh, in, in 2008 uh, as as part of uh, as part of an effort, and uh, and Young beat him beat him badly um, when Parnell was lieutenant governor, and. Uh, and so it's going to take somebody with name recognition to get up there and to run on these fiscal issues. I think, I think Alaskans, if they focus, if they were focused on the fiscal issues, would choose uh, a challenger to, to to Don Young. I mean, Young, yeah, Young has not been fiscally conservative as much as he likes to talk about it. He's not been fiscally conservative, and I think Alaskans would choose a, a challenger who ran against him on fiscal issues. But it's got to be somebody with name recognition. We've got all these people. You know who who are rumored to be you know want to be U.S. representatives, but they're all waiting for Don to retire and tap them on the shoulder and say, "This is the one. This is my chosen successor." Well, I don't think Don's going to do that. I think he's going to the end, whatever the end is, whether whether it's <laughs> uh, you know finally health issues or finally getting defeated. And I think if if one of those you know young young bucks has been waiting on him to tap the when waiting to tap him on the shoulder. Uh, tap that person on the shoulder, I, I think they're going to have to step up and do it because I don't think Young's otherwise going to step down. Right. Well, and I, and I agree. I think that I agree with that analysis. I think that that's accurate. Uh, Harold says he thinks that with his legacy of taps and Anwar and, and more, he said he doesn't think fish, fiscal issues would stick to Don. Um, which I I agree he's got huge accomplishments, but at the same time, I think more and more people are becoming aware of the fiscal instability that we're facing in this country, and I think it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Oh, I think it is, too. And, and in the next two years, I think we're going to hit another fiscal, another economic uh, downturn uh, in this country. When you look at the, at the, at the people who, uh, uh, who do these things for a living, make these estimates for a living, there's a, there's a high uh, degree of, 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 of predictions that we're going to be in an economic downturn. Uh, in in 2020 or shortly thereafter, and as we hit that economic downturn, people are going to say, "Well, what's government going to do about it?" And the and the and the fact is, just like you know, we talk about occasionally on the show with the CBR, we have to fill it back up to be ready for the next uh, fiscal situation. We we need to do that at the federal government level too by paying down debt and creating room uh, in our in our budget to be able to uh, uh, deal with. Um, uh, economic downturns when they occur, but we haven't done it at the federal level. So when we when we hit the ne- ex- economic downturn, I think we're going to have a lot of people focused on fiscal issues about the impact of the federal government can't do things that it's done in the past because of the constraints imposed by the failure to have solid fiscal policy uh, during during this economic upturn. And they're going to be looking for who caused that situation, who who put us into this fiscal uh, situation as we go go into the downturn. And Don Young's certainly going to be one of those one of those who caused, not one of those who uh, uh, who uh, who helped. Uh, And so as that issue rises in the next economic downturn, I think Don will be vulnerable on uh, on fiscal issues. Uh, Brad, we've got about 90 seconds here. Your third one is the fate of AGDC. Can you give us the short version? Uh, and then we'll continue the, with the you very, the break. The very short version is with Walker gone, AGDC is going to change. And I think the first step of any new governor, uh, of either new governor, whether it's Dunleavy or Begich, needs to be to call the producers back in, the three big producers back in, and say, we know you support this project. Uh, two of you have sold gas to the project. Two of you are viewing it as a go-forward uh, project from that standpoint. The third of you, Conoco Phillips has talked about being supportive of the project. Let's let's get back. Let's get the three of us, three of you back in the room with the state, who's a necessary party to this because the state's the resource center uh, and the taxer, and let's figure out where we go from point forward. I think AGDC with, uh, has run its life uh, as, a, as, a, as a state, uh, sole state-run uh, uh, enterprise. With Walker's step down, it gives the new governor the ability to come back in and redo it. We need to keep going forward with monetizing our gas resources. We need to keep keep going forward with an LNG project, but it needs to be in a different format. And I think Walker stepping out of the game certainly opened, creates that opportunity for the next governor to step 
in there and uh, and redirect it. Do you think it gets disbanded, or does it uh, just fundamentally change? No, HEDC needs to stay in shape. I mean, there's tax benefits. The reason we had created HEDC in the first place, and it was done in the Parnell administration, right? But With- the reason it was it continued was because there's certain tax benefits having the state the owner of the of the kit. So All right. we need to we need to keep the state involved. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for being here with us. Uh, Brad Keithley, thank you so much. Uh, any final thoughts on uh, on you know what you didn't get to cover there on AGDC or anything else before I let you go? No, I AGDC. Um, I think it's important. I mean, some people are going to say if Dunleavy is elected because Dunleavy is, has has not been a big fan of of AGDC. I think some people are going to say disband it, defund it, set it you know send it out to pasture. Uh, turn it back over to the to the three, the big three, um, and uh, and and the state backs out of it. I, w- w- that's the wrong approach to take. Um, uh, the the uh, Wood Mackenzie analysis that that was two or three years ago now said, look, this is a challenge project economically. One of the ways you you improve it economically is to bring the state in as the owner of the kit, uh, the facilities. Uh, there's a different tax status for the state as owner. Uh, and that that improves the economics, and that and that's still true um, of the project. So there's a reason to keep AGDC involved. The, the what Walker did was was step AGDC out in front um, and essentially turn try to turn the producers into into second tier second role players. We we can't we can't we're not going to be able to bring this project to fruition that way. We need to bring the producers back in. It needs to be a four way uh, project with the big three. Um, and the state uh, playing an appropriate role in that. And hopefully Dunleavy, uh, if Dunleavy is the one elected, Dunleavy will see that um, as a way forward. Uh, Begich, uh, Begich hasn't even talked. He's talked about the need to monetize the uh, gas resources, but hasn't right. talked about really how to do it. Um, Dunleavy, as I say, has talked uh, badly about AGDC. But he, any, he, whoever's elected, they need to keep AGDC in the in the process we just need to reformulate uh the role sort of bring the band back together again uh, before <laughs> walker walker took the ball and said we'll 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 run with the ball now thank you very much we need to bring the old band right the old four party band back together again. instead of going solo we should have we should have kept the band together uh harold says walker should have created the aodc the alaska oil development corp and started to develop our own oil um I have a feeling you'd disagree with that simply because of specialization. But uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, one could say we tried to do that with uh, with uh, the old tax credits uh, to subsidize uh, development out there. Uh, that was a that's a project that uh, many have different opinions on. I think it was a waste of money. I think we would have done better if we would have taken the same money and put it in the permanent fund and invested it in the market. Um, but but certainly it's been done away with now. We sort of tried that. Uh, and, um, and 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 I, and I think what we're finding is lowering regulations, as the Trump administration do, has done, and increasing oil prices is the best oil development corporation we possibly could have uh, without putting state dollars at risk. Right. So, right. Um, hope, we should have done it. We should have done those two steps: lowering regulation and uh, and and higher oil prices sooner. But. They've happened, and I think oil development is going to take its natural course. It's always good to have you on, my friend. Thank you so much for bringing your commentary and your and your insight into this. We definitely appreciate you being part of it today. Michael, thanks, uh, as always, for having Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.